talk uh, a few months ago, late last year, on kind of tooling in Haskell. Um, kind of my experiences with writing some Haskell software that we're actually we're using production at the moment um, uh, at work. And I, I did just kind of a bunch of command line tools and the compiler and GHCI and things like that kind of help you get started. And I sort of want to continue on a little bit from that and talk about the project um, that I've been working on and how it's kind of progressed over the time from sort of bad code to getting better code. So the sort of the, the Cliff Notes version is that you can start writing really bad Haskell, really bad code, and get better with time. And that process is uh, not too bad. It's a lot easier than um, sort of reining in uh, other projects I've worked on in Ruby and in Java, where I feel like you have to have a lot of control at the start to build your project well, and then keep it that way. With Haskell, it seemed like it was okay to just go up and write lots of shit, and then kind of fix it as time went on. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it was good. Uh, so yeah, I want to talk about Kit. Um, so Kit, at work, we do iPhone, iPhone and iPad applications. So they're in Objective-C. Um, and in Objective-C, there's no kind of dependency management tool like Cabal for Haskell, uh, RubyGems, Ivy Maven, that sort of stuff that goes out and grabs your dependencies and sets up your project to depend and compile with them and all that sort of stuff. So Kit does that for um, Objective-C projects using Xcode um, and it's a, a real time saver for us so we don't use git submodules now we just kind of publish these packages with versions and Kit kind of pulls them from a central place and sticks all in your project um, and we use it day to day to do all our stuff um, so this is how we get started with it this is a slide from my last talk uh, and we've been going for about 12 months now using it um, and everyone at work using it um, so Kit started, uh, it was actually written, most of what we needed was written in one weekend. Uh, it was a Rails camp. Um, if anyone's been to a Rails camp, they're a, they're a weekend from a Friday to a Monday. You're locked away uh, from the internet, um, supposedly. Um, so you've got no access to docs, you've got no access to any outside assistance. Um, so I'm at a Rails camp, there's no one else who's writing Haskell. Um, uh, although I found out later there was one guy um, who's written a Ruby Haskell bridge, which was pretty interesting. Um, and I had not a lot of Haskell knowledge at all, and there's an awful lot of drinking going on, so, you know, it's possibly not the best environment for, to craft good code, but it was great for kind of knocking out this prototype and being really happy about what I'd done every kind of 10 minutes or so. So, after all that, it was pretty bad, the code, from a Haskell perspective. Um, so what do I mean? in terms of Haskell being bad, uh, just about every function in Kit had I.O. in the type, which means it's doing some sort of side effect. You know, it's reading stuff from the file system, it's writing out files, simple stuff like printing out um, to stand it out, um, all that sort of stuff. I.O. is everywhere, um, which, which is a problem when you try and... Uh, also, there were no tests. Absolutely none. I'd kind of just been mocking it up and it's kind of iteration testing, I guess. I had a goal for what I wanted. I was just kind of iterating towards that uh, just by running it up in Xcode and see if everything compiled from that end. Um, so if you've got I.O. everywhere, it's hard to break your functions apart because you have to work out where the effects are. You know, it's like breaking functions apart, I guess, in just about every other language. You have to work out where your effects are and make sure when you break them apart, you haven't actually changed the semantics when you put them back together again, so everything kind of works. Um, I had no knowledge of the standard library or sort of general libraries that were around on Haskip, Hackage and I had no access to them so I couldn't really learn if I wanted to. Um, and I learnt later they're just a bunch of things that I was doing that were, were messy and there were ways I could clean that up. So I want to talk about those kind of things. And really from here it could only get better which is great. So I've had kind of 12 months after that. The project's pretty small um, in terms of lines of code. It started out maybe 2000. Um, and with some, you know, learning of the standard library and packages and how to do things properly, it's down to about 700, you know, with four or five times the features or whatever. So, it's 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 uh, it's improving. Um, so the the first thing I kind of tried to do in cleaning it up and making sure I could kind of pull it apart and work with it, because I need to be able to make changes without knowing I'd be breaking what everyone was doing. And I had some kind of projects I'd use to sort of run up on the big scale and check that all their dependencies were pulled in properly. Um, but that was 
pretty painful and I wanted to be able to iterate smaller. So I was trying to get rid of I.O. from everything so I could work with stuff and make stuff fail in the compiler rather than fail later when I was kind of running this test that might take a few minutes to run. Um, so I was working out what kind of uh, effects that my particular application had to do. And for Kit, um, it's a lot about taking, reading, uh, you need to read in a config file from a file system and pull in your, your external dependencies and then produce a, an Xcode project according to a template um, and some Xcode configuration files tell the user what's going on at the same time so there's some logging in there um, but it was really the creation of the files that were the core of what, what Kit's all about so I need to be able to test that a little bit better um, without having IO in there. So this is kind of how things were written in the old way before I kind of cleaned it up. If I had to write out a configure, an Xcode configuration file, I'd build up a nice configuration data type, had a function that spat it out to IO to a particular place because the configuration file always goes in one place, which is fine. Um, and you know, that was implemented with a couple of functions, one that turned the string into the content, one that <coughs> took the content, wrote it to the file in the place. So I could kind of break it up a little bit. But at some point, I still had to have the, the right of my file to the file system before I could kind of test it at some level. So, you know, in one action of this code that was doing this, IO had to be in the type signature, and I wasn't restricting what kind of effects were going on. Um, so I had to have IO kind of all the way deep down. So what I came up with was a, um, a data type to represent the kind of operations I was doing. So at the moment, it's called FS action, and um, I'm flying a little bit blind. I don't know if this is something that other people in Haskell have done or solved. I haven't seen anything on Hackage. It's possibly a kind of a little problem that um, doesn't really affect people in the general sense. So uh, Kit needs to be able to create files in a certain location. The string representing the content there, it's all kind of string based. Um, it does some resource management and sort of symlink stuff into a common place to when you change version, the files are stable and you can rely on images and um, you know, sort of uh, database stuff, not changing path as you change versions. Um, and then you want to be able to change where those things are happening in certain directories. So you can have these FS actions created in one place under a certain subdirectory perhaps and then sort of change that later on in the case, which is what that in directory is. And then there's a way of turning one of them into a side effect um, and executing it. So this stuff is now written and really well tested. Um, some bits about it are quite tricky, like the symlinking. When you want to change the path of a symlink, the symlink's target has to be relative to where the link is going to exist. So if you change your link name to be kind of one directory up, you have to make sure you stick a dot dot on the target name, otherwise the symlink doesn't work. So a few things like that that um, I was able to solve and test in one place, keep all my IO there, and then I could change my um, write actions a little bit. So the creating a kit config was a matter of producing a file system action. And I could test that, I could just check the content, I could check the file location differently. Um, and then when I had to do my big kind of setup, lots of different things, so you know, that might be writing three files and symlinking four or five different resources. That's just an array of actions that are all pure, and I can just check for the existence and compare equality on those lists to make sure that all that kind of stuff works. Um, and then I can start putting in some quick check properties around this kind of stuff, which is where I want to get to. So at the moment, I'm still doing the, I've got a couple of big integration tests that check stuff against big projects. But once I can move IO out of more things, I can start developing the quick check properties that sort of define the system and go from there. Um, so there's still a few more things I want to do on cleaning I.O. And this kind of ties in a little bit with what Tony's going to be talking about. Um, using some monads to pull to do my I.O. in one place and sort of augment the values later. And hopefully Tony can explain that a little better than I can. Um, so when I've got functions that are all depending on kind of environment values, like the kit specification that's in the root of every project wherever you're working, that's kind of like a global that you just want to be able to pull in and use. Um, using the reader to kind of extract that, have it all in one place, applied through. And clean up my logging so I can do sort of log level stuff in a pure way and only have it evaluated when I actually want to spit out logging and not have it when I don't want to, all that kind of stuff. And there's a few other ideas. 
Um, so that's kind of the I.O. cleanup stuff. Uh, the next was kind of, as I learnt the standard library, you know, I could pull uh, the code size down and start to take advantage of what other people are doing. And my favourite kind of example was this, of this is how I worked on unfolding the dependencies for a kit. So kit's what we call also the, the little package, a bit like a gem or a jar, I guess. Um, so these type signatures are kind of what they are at the moment, that you start with a kit. And I've drawn that up on the board. Um, your kit at the top is your project A, and then you can see kind of, you know, its dependencies are a tree out from that. Um, before I started looking at it this way, I was just kind of doing a recursive method. So find the dependencies for A, then if that list was non-empty, you'd be going down and finding the dependencies for all the dependencies until you were done. And that turned out to be kind of bad because the list in the end, you'd end up with <coughs> A first and then its depths and then each of their depths. But it was in the wrong order. Uh, so this would, be, would have been ended up as A, B, P, Q, C, Z, and Z. And I would have called the duplicates or something like that. So it would have been down here, these first. Anyway, I had to fix a bug where dependencies down at the bottom have to be loaded before anything at the top. Because if you build, um, in these C projects, you rely on a prefix header for a lot of stuff to kind of load up uh, the environment for that static lib, or the headers it, it depends on, rather than having more specified in each individual file. And if you load up, uh, if you try and load A before you've got P done, then it all falls over. Uh, so when I was kind of looking at that bug, I realised that the, you know things were much better represented by a tree. So I started looking into how the standard library could help me collapse this tree a little bit more cleaner than the recursive function I had going. And um, I had a couple of rules I needed to uh, preserve the or well, not preserve the order. I needed the order to be like this: bottom level first, and no duplicates. And what was a kind of complicated recursive method turned into something pretty much like this. Um, so this is point three. So this is a function that, given a tree of dependencies like this, um, you read it kind of right to left. For, what's that? What's levels? Yeah. So reading it, it reads right to left. So levels takes a tree yep. and then gives you a, a list. list of lists. Yeah, a list of lists, yeah. one for every level in the tree. Yep. So it'll give you a list of A, followed by a list of B, C, Z, and a list of P, Q, Z, and all this time S. So it gives you the levels. So I want it. Um, and then Top of the tree, we are the projects, we don't need the dependency anymore. Well, we don't need to. This is the project we're looking for the dependency of, so we can scratch that from our dependency list. So we drop one, which is the first. Uh, and then reverse it so that we get the bottom of the list first. So we end up with PQZ followed by PZZ. And then cat add two lists into PQ. Z, B, C, Z, and then it's used enough to remove the last duplicate entry, which is how it works. Which was just with that, which is exactly what I wanted. Um, and it made it much clearer. And the guys at work who aren't necessarily, um, none of them started using Haskell yet, but I was able to kind of, you know, talk through the problem. They can all read this kind of one line and go, oh, wow, yeah, I can see exactly how that's working and how the dependencies are resolved and, and filtered and that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, at the, I need to change this soon. At the moment, it's only um, it's not doing any kind of version comparison, so it'll get a little bit more complicated, but that'll kind of just happen in the nub stage, um, which is probably the hardest function to find in Haskell because nobody else calls that function nub, I don't think. I don't know where that came from. So what's nub? It removes duplicate elements from a list. So I used to know where that name came from. Yeah, I'm not sure where it comes from now. So if you've got a list, does it not require a sort 
first? No, it runs in. Uh, it's terrible it's, performance. It's end of the two, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a list, but it only requires one. equality on the elements. Yeah, not ordering. Yeah. Um, I think it doesn't buy successive filtering for every okay. element. It filters the list, and making sure that it doesn't find them again. That's the best you can do with equality yeah. on the elements. Yeah. So it finds one, and then it filters the tail based on whether or not you know that is not equal to one. It finds two, filters the tail and not equal to two, and not equal to one. Um, except it doesn't do it like that. It does first one, then two, then three, two, then one. So it filters out two and one in this case, leaving us with one, two, three, four. Um, and the, again, the order's not important there. So yeah, none is you know unique or um, I don't know what else. Unique. I've only ever called. It, not, it could be more useful by having ordering on the elements, right? No, it could be. What do you mean by unique? Unique is what that method is called in, in many other. Oh, sorry. Totally misheard you. Okay. Yeah, so it took me ages to find out NUB, um, but it's, it's, just, it's got to be just about the most commonly asked question on the Haskell mailing list or the, the Haskell IRC, I guess. And it's, it comes from um, NUB meaning the gist or the essence of something, so it's, a, it's tenuous <laughs> at best. Um, right, so uh, a couple of other things I cleaned up, um, I don't want to get too much into these, but uh, I was gobbling to find files, so you know, you've got a package of source and I need to find out all the header files in certain directories and um, implementation files, configuration files, and I was using the, you know, the star star slash star kind of shell method um, to do that kind of expansion. and. There's, there didn't seem to be anything I could find myself when I was isolated, no internet. Um, so I just shelled out to Ruby, because um, I knew how to write Glob syntax in Ruby. I could probably could have shelled out to LS just as fine, but I've done a whole lot of Ruby and I was at Rails camp, so you know, that worked well. Uh, it turned out there was a Glob package when I got back, and Glob had a <coughs> command that would compile the, the Glob syntax into something that was a bit closer to just a predicate on a list, so I could again split my uh, function to a pure and impure sort of component and sort of make sure that was all going well. Because making sure I pick up all the files is, a, is pretty important for Kit because it sort of packages everything and puts it somewhere so if it's missed stuff, nothing works later on. And the other thing I was doing was command arg parsing where I was just expecting things to match on arrays. So the command args had to be in a certain order, otherwise nothing would work. If you got, you know, if you stuck a, a help at the second element instead of the third, you know, that sort of stuff, it would all fall over. So I've moved on to a package for that, which seems to be working really nicely, called Command Dogs. Um, yeah. So, just general code tidying, I guess. Um, I mentioned before uh, prefix headers, which we use in all our kind of Objective-C apps, just to put all our standard library sort of imports um, and our dependency imports in one place, so we don't have to kind of scatter it throughout because um, we've got a couple of common um, you know, sort of useful projects we use over everything. It's nice to have it all in one place. Um, I kind of think of it as an application-specific base library, You're kind of extending the base, which is a set of imports you get with everything with your own kind of stuff. And uh, there is a way to do this in Haskell, but before I knew, I kind of had a whole bunch of imports that I was doing in everything. So Kit does a lot of file system work, a lot of directory listing sort of stuff. So I had these kind of imports file path POSIX and just system of file path and directory. Um, I was really getting into using control.applicative and control.monad um, um, using them, but I had the imports all over the place in every file, so in, things were getting quite long, particularly when you start using you know, the data types like data.list and its methods all over. Um, but Haskell has a really convenient way of uh, declaring that your module both exports its own um, sort of uh, symbols as well as other people's. So this is when you're declaring your module, so you've got implementation of all your functions going down here. Um, you say that you export yourself, but I'm also exporting these other modules which I've imported further down and providing all those methods um, to anyone who imports my kit.util. Um, so, you know, I could clean, clean it up into just sort of that and all this stuff, so I can kind of, as I 
learn things, you know, maybe I want to start getting into using, um, oh, I don't know, control the arrow or something, because I want to play with that sort of thing. I could stick it in control.util, uh, keep.util, and just start using it all over the place and playing with that. Um, and I should really call util something else, but I haven't come up with a good name. Kit.core, I don't know, kit.base. What's that? Swizzle. Swizzle, yeah. No. Um. <laughs> I use Swizzle everywhere. Oh, uh, yeah? I have arguments with guys at work that say, what should I call this? And when they have this argument, the other people do, and I go, I'll go and call it Swizzle. Well, while, they are, while they're still arguing. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's a guy at work who's banned a bunch of stuff, or tries to ban us from using a whole bunch of stuff like util, uh, oh, okay. service, handler, helper, all that kind of stuff. I said, no, just, just drop it, just leave it also whatever. A dollar. I've so I should just call it kit. Can I use Unicode in a file name? Probably not a window, so yeah, you can. Can you? Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of the tips I want to go through, um, and that's kind of the question. No, it's really not. It's not good yet. There's a whole bunch of stuff I can keep going and keep adding, but I found it really easy to sort of plug things in later on and get myself to a good point without without too much pain. Um, with some nice kind of big interaction tests and then pulling the I.O. out and then feeling really comfortable about changing the internals um, with, you know, and knowing that the transformations I'm making um, are all working and not breaking anything. So there's a few ideas I really want to um, play with. Um, some ride T for logging and getting rid of I.O. from, we should get onto Monad, maybe we'll get a bit of Monad stacks later. Um, I.O. is still on my Monad stack, which kind of means that wherever I want to use a few different monads. I've also got access to I.O. to do to do everything and um, not be pure. So I want to get rid of that and then get into some properties. And uh, there's a, that, um, it was mentioned in the last talk on uh, X monad, um, the advice from the X monad and uh, the real world Haskell book is to um, start with specifying the properties of your system in quick check and then later on try and refactor those into types. So um, I think that'd be a really good technique to learn, so that's where I want to get to on that stuff. But I'm not yet yet, and I think that's okay. Well, that's it. Thanks, Matt. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Why did you choose Haskell? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's a general purpose, general purpose programming language. But of all places, no, that's to pick um, to start a Haskell project. You're yeah. Half pissed at a rails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you've answered your own question. <laughs> um, it's because you're that drunk. Calm the thought of stomaching anything to do with review is a bit much. In my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I do day to day now. So yes, yes. Come to think of it. Uh, no. Um, I can't remember to be honest. I'd kind of been looking for a thing to do in Haskell for a long time because I'd only used it for learning, and it was this was a really good kind of tool because it's it's just command line. Um, the clients are all developers, so they're happy installing stuff, um, installing dev tools and SDKs and all that kind of stuff. So I knew it'd be pretty easy to get them onto it. At first, I was prototyping in Haskell and thought I'd port it to Ruby after, you know, I'd kind of proven the idea to get more traction. Um, and then I decided I didn't care. Um, I was happy just it, it. It's a complicated problem to solve generally for other people. Like there's a whole bunch of things in Xcode that we restrict that you can only do in certain ways. Um, and I haven't had time to document and really make that. So what you mean is that you decided that you did care? Well, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was it. Mostly it was just looking for a project and this being command line and clients develop. So, yeah. So what was the? Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that you had C plus plus and Java projects, which you found harder to factor. So why, why was this so much easier to effect? I think it's the if checking the if checking of effects of functions and knowing once you had pure functions, um, you could compose them and have the compiler tell you whether or not things were going to work. Uh, particularly given this was you know untested, um, so large untested code bases in in say Ruby, um, it can be difficult. Like the, the effects just get in there. Um, and then you don't know until, unless your test suite is really good whether or not you've sort of changed things in a, um, whether you've done transformations that have had no effect. So once I was kind of uh, 
getting rid of IO a little bit, it was very easy to make changes to the code that I knew were just kind of, um, you know, kind of semantic changes, little, you know, bits that I could say, yes, I've made no impact on the actual solution and do a bunch of them to get to the point where I could then make my real change in a kind of pure place is, I, I think that's the best way. So yeah, it was the effect system and um, was what really, I think, made it easy. What was your reaction to the number of bugs that you had once you started testing the software? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of curious how many bugs you did end up with. Um, not too many. Um, a lot of the bugs were where I didn't understand how something worked. Like the, it's right at the edge where it's like the sim linking thing. I had bugs in getting those paths right because I didn't realise how uh, the, the name linking kind of went on. Um, and that in the templates, rather, yeah. Rather than well, yes, yes. And the other thing I had was when I did it first off. There's a lot of string templates in there. It was a basically take an Xcode project that exists, copy and paste that into a Haskell file, into a string, um, and then sub out bits where I'd have to produce a string and stick it in there. Um, but a, a Xcode projects is a defined format, and I had a lot of problems changing that. Not so much bugs, but it would just take me a long time to verify that it was all working once I made changes to what was in that project, because it was just string interpolation. And once I changed that, I've now got a, um, an API for generating those, has, those Xcode projects from a data structure. It made it much easier. So there, yeah. Um, uh, the, yeah, I guess that'd be where most of the bugs were, were around the string templates, particularly initially. So yeah, once I turned that into data structures, things got better. Cool. All right. You're on. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks.